Brother Wayne Blake graduated from Freed Harmon University back in 1992. He's also a graduate of uh, what was then Spring Bible Institute in 1998 here. And he preached full-time for 12 years, and he's been preaching part-time for 26 years. Preached in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and te Tennessee. He worked with uh, Bible camps in Texas and Louisiana. He's spoken on lectureships in Texas, Tennessee, Louisiana, Florida. His wife is Laura, and they have one daughter, Jenna, who's with us. Laura, I think he's had to work today, is that right? And uh, Brother Weldon, Blake's his father, and uh, his mother's here too. And we're grateful that we can uh, know them and have a close association with the Fitch Hatchery Road congregation where he's a member in Huntsville, Texas. There's one thing, Wayne, you left off of here. Uh, your employment with the gated city in Huntsville. I like to pick at him about that. But that was a little different situation <laughs> than these others. But we want to hear Wayne speak to us on Christ confronted worry. So we hope that you'll come and deliver this lesson, and we look forward to hearing it. It's always a pleasure to be able to speak and to be able to be invited to be a part of lectureships like this and others, sound congregations, elderships, gospel preachers in the audience. Um, I remember when I was a student and then when I first began preaching, one of the scariest things for me was to be able to speak to other preachers. That just scared me to death. Because it's like, what do I have to say that they would want to hear? And anyone who has done public speaking knows that's scary in and of itself. And then when people start praying for you, you even get worried. <laughs> what am I gotten myself into? And this morning, we're going to talk about Christ confronting worry. You know, I look around the world and I see a people that are worried to the point of chaos. People are worried who's going to be the president. People are worried about who's going to be the latest leader of some foreign government. The price of gasoline. The carbon footprint that we're all leaving behind. The amount of coffee or the amount of tea someone drinks. <laughs> We, who's moved in down the street? If you got kids, that does concern you. Who lives across the street, just crossing a street? Driving to the lectureship from out of town into the big city. Driving down here, it will wear on you. Whether we're going to the the prescriptions that our schools say our children must have in order to attend school, whether what types of ramifications are going to happen behind these types of medications, the kind of cars that we drive, and worries about almost every aspect of our human existence. I uh, find it as a curiosity a show called Doomsday Preppers. And if any of you have ever watched this, it is a curiosity. And I know some people like this that are of this mentality. I have a brother-in-law. If you don't know what this show is, I'll just very briefly. They uh, go into a family, a snapshot of a family. And this family believes that the world is coming to an end in some sense. Uh, whether... Uh, the financial markets are going to be torn down, the uh, oil is going to be taken away, or whether our government's going to take this or do that. In other words, there's all types of calamities that are going to come upon us as a human ex experience. And these people have dug bump bunkers down in the bottom of the ground, underneath, and they have built these underground cities, and with... MREs and all these kind of things down there to where that whenever this great calamity happens, they're going to run to the hills 
and they're going to get out in the ground and they have enough food and water and the ability to live in these underground bunkers for an extended period of time while all the bad stuff is going on up here. Folks, we are confronted with worry all around us. People that are just worried. They're spreading their doom and gloom. You read about the dangers and pitfalls of life here on earth. We read about it daily, hourly. There's no small wonder why half of our population is either medicated, high, or drunk on the latest thing that has come down the pike because they just don't want to deal with what's going on around them. Where does all this stop? Can it be stopped? Or is just mankind just getting caught up so much in this frenzy that we're nothing more than a bunch of worriers? You know, Jesus dealt with this same type of mindset. Those same weak need, those who were faithless, this attitude that plagued mankind even in the first century and before then. But Jesus particularly dealt with this very idea. If you want to, turn over to Matthew chapter 6. People have jumped all over this, and they haven't dealt with my thing, so I'm all right. They've mentioned it, but they haven't said it, uh, talked about it, so I was happy. He begins in verse 20, 25. He says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your own body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? We're not going to make any smart jokes. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The very thought that Jesus would tell man, quit worrying. That's confrontational in and of itself. I know when I tell my daughter to quit worrying, that doesn't help her. It didn't help my parents when they tell me to quit worrying. Just to be told to quit worrying doesn't help. Because that only compounds the problem. We've got to get to the root of the problem. Why is it that I worry? What are the concerns that I'm dealing with? Well, Jesus said, give no thought to these things. Worry. The sin of worry. Anxiety. Exaggerated concern. Is equated with the lack of faith. And that's what Jesus is saying. Don't be living in a life as a Christian with a lack of faith. The Lord promised us that, he will, that we will be given the things that we need to eat, to drink, and to be clothed. And he said everything else, quit worrying about it. Now that's pretty revolutionary. Because what about this? What about that? You see, in our minds... Food and clothing and, uh, well, you know, that's just the very basics. Well, I've got a lot more to be concerned about. Jesus said, don't be anxious about those things. 
Anxiety, simply defined, just simply means an uneasiness of mind or a brooding fear about some con contingency. Worry is defined as to afflict with mental distress or agitation. Simply put, ag anxiety is concern gone to seed. You know, when I first began working in the corrections, you go through a training period where you go into an academy, and like, much like a police academy kind of thing. And um, one thing they used to tell us was when you see a fight, you don't do what your first impulse is, and that's to run in there and try to break it up. It says, no, you wait for reinforcements. And the first time I ever saw a knife fight, and it was a pretty bad one, my first impulse was to run in there and try to break it up. I saw someone do that one time, and you know what happened to that officer? He got stabbed. Because when two people are going at it, they're not concerned about what's in front of them. They're just going at it. And you go in there and try to break that up, you might accidentally, and maybe in some cases purposely, also get hurt. You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 5 and verse 15 that we are to walk circumspectly. The idea there is that we're to be careful as we go through life. Pay attention to your surroundings. Know what's going on around you. Be informed. And somehow or another, we've got to reconcile that mindset that I am careful, I pay attention, I'm watching I'm, I'm noticing the things that are around me. But I've also got to figure out a way not to be worried about it. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying you just go blindly through life and don't know what's going on one way or the other, and you just kind of fall through life. That's not what he's saying here. But what we are to do is not to be worriers. Not to be worriers. You know, I want to begin by saying this, because this, like the book of James, is easy to understand, but it's hard to apply. All of us in this room here right now, at some time or another, have worried about things. Some of you might be worried about something right now. Did you leave the coffee pot running this morning? Is, your, is someone going to break into your house? Is someone going to, and I'm not asking for any of these things to happen, but just by parking your car right out here, is something going to happen to it? We might have those kind of thoughts in our minds. Jesus says, quit worrying. Don't be anxious. So it's easier to say it and to understand it but it's applying it where we have problems. The Christian will constantly struggle with concern as we live here in this world. But we need to remember the command of Jesus to stop worrying about things that we have no control over. And that's where it really comes down to. You know, you got bad weather coming in. I live in a modular home. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's a house on wheels, but it's nicer. <laughs> I always called it a trailer. My wife finally very quickly told me, quit telling people you live in a trailer. We live in a modular home. If it's got wheels, what is it? It's not sitting on the ground. Anyway. We live in a modular home. <laughs> and as you know, those are magnets for what? Tornadoes. If you don't know about tornadoes, you're not from around here. We get high winds a lot. But you know what? When I know there's things like that in the area, and it's bedtime, guess what? I'm going to bed. <laughs> And I've been asked, how can you sleep with all this bad weather? Because you know what? If I worry about that, I'll be up all night. 
I can't worry about that. And if it's my day to go, then it's my day to go. You see, there are some things we have no control over. And I'm going to tell you something. No matter what the scientists and the nuts say, we have no control over this climate. What's coming is coming. And if it's going to be a hurricane, if it's going to be a tornado, or if it's just going to be a simple shower, it's coming. And there's nothing you're going to do to stop it. Well, that's the problem. We're going to struggle with this all the time. But we need to be content with the things we know and know that we're going to be blessed with, and that is food and clothing. God's told us he'll provide those things. So quit worrying. Jesus reminds us that it's a fruitless to worry. To the very simple idea of our height, how many of us could add just one little inch to our height? You know, if I was six foot six, I wouldn't have a weight problem. <laughs> and if some people were whatever, if their parents weren't so ugly, they wouldn't be ugly. <laughs> or their nose wouldn't be so big. Or their feet wouldn't be so small. Or whatever. Just fill in the blank. But, you know, we live in a world that is concerned about all those things. Concerned to the point where there are people that are walking around this world that are more plastic than they are human. <laughs> we do have robots among us. <laughs> Aliens. They're here. But people worry about that. They worry about it to the point where they'll spend everything they have to look or be something else. You know, you can go to a plastic surgeon and they'll nip and tuck anything you want and change your looks and anything you want changed. They'll do it for you. They'll change you from a man to a woman or a woman to a man. They'll do whatever you want. People are worried. People are worried. Jesus tells all these things are vanity. They're empty. They're vain. Why be concerned about those things? Where is our faith, our confidence that God will provide the things we need? You know, I don't need a smaller nose. I don't need a bigger nose to get through this life. But there are some things I do need. I need air. I need food. And I need clothing. Because I really don't want to see a bunch of naked people walking around. And a lot of people wouldn't want to see me naked. So let's just be honest. We do need clothing, but we do need food, and we need water. But the Bible says that's all we need to be concerned about. Is our height, our weight, or our looks going to directly affect where we're going to spend eternity? It will if our attitude is wrong about them. Because worry is a sin. Jesus tells us that. Jesus reminds us that God feeds the small birds and the plants, and he cares for all of creation. Yet Jesus asks, are you not worth more than they? Very simple question. Are you not worth more than they? How many birds have you heard tell you or express to you in some way that they're concerned about the food? How many flowers are concerned? about how they're going to be taken care of. You see, the idea there is they just come and go. They're not concerned about those things. And if they're not concerned, Jesus says, are you not worth more than they? If God takes care of them providentially, will he not take care of you also? There's something that is different between us and them. We're creating God's image. They're not. They're souls. We are souls. They are not. The Jews of Jesus' time were concerned with appearance, how much land they had, how much money, how much wealth they've had. 
Yet Jesus says we're not to worry about those kind of things. Don't be like that. We must not forget what is truly important. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, seek the kingdom first. That's what's important. That's what's important for all of us. <clears throat> the emphasis in Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 is on the word therefore. There is a word there that is, that is what we call a conclusion indicator. Basically what it says, in light of the things that I have said, therefore, listen to this. And it began in verse 19 down through verse 24. And it teaches us that we're not to worry about the riches of this world. Someone's already talked about that. We are to trust in heavenly riches and not in worldly riches. Don't be concerned about those things. There is no amount of fame or fortune in this world that can change the fact that with every breath you take, you're getting closer to death. I told that to a young person one time. I asked him, I said, you know, every day you live, you're getting closer to death, and I just blew his mind. Because he had never thought about it like that. Well, us who are getting close to 50, you know, we think about that. <laughs> think about it a lot more than we did when we were 15. I didn't think about death all that much when I was 15. But, boy, when I hit 30, then when I hit 40, and then this year when I'm fixing to hit 50, let me tell you something. I'm thinking about death pretty, pretty often. And not that I'm looking forward to leaving this world in the sense of family and all that, leaving them behind. But the idea is, folks, every breath we take, we're getting close to that time. That much closer. Yet I find this whole idea of the global warming issue to be one of the most blatant signs of man's arrogance. This along with many of the other man-made disasters that man derives, he continues to devise, just shows how ungodly and ignorant people are today. We're told that we need to save this planet. Well, how are we supposed to do that? Well, quit buying paper. Save the trees. You know, I, I, they used to give you an option. They've even taken that away from you now. Paper or plastic? I'd always say, I want paper because I want to kill some trees. And I would say that to the person. Some of them would laugh and other ones would walk away in fear because they thought he's got a bomb on him or something. Well, now you go to a store, you don't get that option. You don't see paper hardly in any stores anymore. But you'll see a lot of plastic. Well, now we don't know what to do with the plastic. Well, there's a singer out there I could not remember when I wrote this, and I still can't remember the lady's name. But some singer out there said, ladies, you only need two squares of toilet paper when you go to the bathroom. Cheryl Crow. I knew it was one of those people. You know, even to that point, that's how our mindset is toward the things of this world. People want to regulate all these things. We're going to stop using paper, gasoline, oil products, meat and dairy to the point uh, of, of even wanting to save the planet. And there is no doubt that the political landscape has caused me to believe that we are destroying this planet. With increased regulations, we now are worried more about bugs, birds, trees, or flowers more than we are about the millions of unborn babies that we are killing every year. But let's save that bug. God provides things for men to use to adapt for his comfort, to be able to, to do the one thing that God has commanded us to do, to seek and save the lost. That's what those things are here for us to use, to provide us the things that we do, to do the very thing that God has commanded us to do. In Luke chapter 10, we're showing a woman named Martha. All of us know of this account. Uh, they're in the house. It says, uh, came to pass, uh, verse uh, 38, 
It says, And it came to pass as they went, and he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And as he had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about, much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? I'm going to tell you something. When you throw a party at your house, it's rough being the only person that's, that's making things and doing things. I, 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 I can relate to that because I've helped my wife do a lot of that. Sometimes she doesn't call it helping. I call it helping. But, you know, sometimes we don't. Bid her, therefore, to come help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about a many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which, has not, which shall not be taken away from her. You know, Martha made a common mistake that a lot of us make. Instead of learning and listening from Jesus, what was she doing? She's worried about setting up worldly things. Things that in and of themselves are nothing wrong with them. In fact, she wanted to do the best she could. Here's Jesus. We've got to put out the best. We've got to do those things. She only wanted to make sure that everything was prepared and in its place. How many times would Jesus come to her house? And would she be given the opportunity to hear the things that he had to say? You know, she forgot a common thing that many of us do. It's not the color of the carpet. It's not the kind of linen or the cloth that you're using. It's not the type of things that you're going to eat off of. Or the amount of forks that you have at a table. Those things don't really matter. What matters is Jesus was there and there was much to learn. She forgot. She overlooked the most important things. And what this does is it puts in our mind the very simple fact that, folks, we need to be concerned about the things that truly matter in this life. How many of us are so caught up in the cares of this world, sports, money, School, looks, the size of our garages, the time we spend on acquiring more and more in this lifetime. And yet we seem to forget the simple things that are most important. Our relationship to God and our obligation to teach others about Jesus Christ. The Bible is very plain. This is the thing that we are to be concerned about. So what's the result of worry? Well, our main aim in life is to preach and teach the gospel to a lost and dying world. That's what Jesus said. And we, by our very nature, borrow enough trouble with the things we do, not, we do know will come to pass. A large part of man's unhappiness comes from the dread and worry about things that we may anticipate happening. And yet, some, many times, do not come to pass. Now, I can remember times in my life when I have sat there and fretted about something to the point where it, it was terrible. I mean, it's just it was wrecking me for that day. And, you know, the next day it happened, and it didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out. And there I had spent all that time in worry about something that I had no control over. And it didn't end the way I thought it would. We are commanded to take no thought for tomorrow. Meaning deal with the things of today that are being brought to our minds. Because worry and dread of tomorrow will only take the focus away of what we ought to be doing today. We wait, we wait, we wait on word about someone who's sick, a job offer, the crime in our world, our looks, our fashion sense, to what avail? To avoid worry, one must first be a Christian. We must be convinced that God will take care of us, and we learn about that through his word. We are assured of his ability to take care of us. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according 
to the power that worketh in us. The Father is good to his children. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 33 and verse 20. God is wise. He is powerful and good. And we should rejoice in what Paul said. All things, and we know that all things work together for them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. In Mark chapter 2, again verse 1 through verse 12. Well, we got to hurry. I'm only on page one. Well, we did have 20 min 10 minutes I know of yesterday that was given back, so I could really take 10 more minutes. Oh, okay, I can't. Boy, just so unfair. All right. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're not going to read this, but what we have here is a situation where a man with palsy they wanted to bring him before Jesus, and the room was so full, the house was full, they couldn't bring him in there through the front door. So what did they do? They tore the roof off, and they lowered the man down in there. And it says in verse 5, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Just the very actions of those people showed Jesus that they had faith. You know, when we're going through the rough times, tough times, and when we are concerned about our physical health or any other things that we deal with from day to day, folks, listen, you show your faith in how you deal with those things. Just like Jesus was able to see the faith of these people. How, do your, how does your, your wife or your husband or your children or your friends, or others who know you're a Christian. When you say you're a Christian and you're trying to do what God wants you to do, and yet you're running around, scared to death of every little thing, fretting about everything in your life, what are you, through your actions, showing those other people about your Christianity? You're showing them that you have no faith in God. You see, Jesus, by their actions, saw they had faith. I can see whether you have faith by the things that you do or don't do in this life. God and brethren know when we, are, when we have the faith that will allow God to take all our anxiety away and leave us with peace that only comes through a complete trust in God. And so we ask the questions. What are our actions saying about us? Do we show. That we have complete trust in God. What is the cure for this? I'm going to skip on. Well like most things. We read about on the sermons of Jesus. Understanding and applying are two different things. But you know, it's not easy going into surgery. It's not easy driving in Houston. It's not easy doing job interviews, and the list can go on and on. But Jesus challenged the people of his day, as well as the people of our day. Jesus said, don't be anxious. You know, it's an immoral response many times. Something just completely blows up, and we're just discombobulated. We just don't know how to handle it. What should we do? How do we cure this problem? Well, first of all, Jesus says we need to pray. I try every time before I stand up before a group of people to say a prayer. That God help me get through and the things I prepared. That I'm not making any mistakes in the sense of, you know, you leave a word out. You could say something you didn't really mean to say. That I think about what I'm saying, prepare my notes, prepare myself before I get up so that I'm ready to give those things. Am I nervous? Yeah, you watch me. You watch me any time before I'm going to get up, watch my feet. They're just dancing. That's just what they do. And if you shake my hand, you shake my hand, I'm cold. 
Why is that? Because I'm nervous. And I pray, and you know what? It just helps me. Ask God to help us. Well, you apply that in your life, well, what should you do? Take a moment and pray. Thank God for the things he has done, but also to get through the problems that we're going through at the time. God's promises he'll take care of those things. He'll help us get through them. Paul wrote in, a, <clears throat> in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. See, he's talking about worry here. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Okay, so when I'm having trouble, Paul says, rejoice. When you pray, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, pray. He says we're to rejoice. This is coming from a man who was locked up and in prison waiting execution. And what's he telling the brethren to do? Rejoice. With prayer and supplication. Make your request known to God. And why? Well, I think there's a key phrase there. He says, because the Lord is at hand. God's there. He's listening to your prayers. And through his providential care, he can help us get through this. Thirdly, we're to be anxious for nothing. Worry causes our influence and our character to be less than what it ought to be. You know, we preach and teach by our example. And our words and our actions cause less assurance to those who profess to be Christians if we are allowing the things of this world to constantly beat us down. We do this by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. If we want to keep worry from our lives, we need to learn, learn to pray more and trust God. Lay our concerns at the feet of our mediator and thank God for all that he does in our lives. You know, I, I think about that and, you know, all of us need to have the mindset that whenever we're in trouble, when things are going the way they are and we just don't, we just seem to be without hope. God says, pray, talk to me is what God says. Talk to me. And God says, I'll listen, and we'll get through this. You know, sometimes that comes from a kind word from a brother or sister in Christ. It comes through a prayer that someone may lead on our behalf. But it also comes by our relationship to God and our talking and communicating with him. Simple statement by Jesus, don't be anxious. Easy to understand but even harder to apply. Thank you for that. I don't know of a more needed lesson in Christian living than a close study of what Brother Wayne has well presented this morning concerning our dealing with the things that Satan throws at us and just simply being a human in the world. <coughs> He didn't know it, but he exemplified just a few minutes ago what's a big bother to all of us. Right in the middle of his sermon, he realized he only had 10 minutes. He started that dancing, and, <laughs> and, and he started uh, bewailing the fact that he didn't have more. And what was it? He was taking up the time that he did have. <laughs> he was worried about it. He was worried about it. Anxious about it. You know, worry is taking thought about that which you can do nothing about. Anxiety is worrying in a fire ant bed. 
And you will dance if you keep standing there. You know, one of our, our, our big problems, and, and I speak for all of us, regarding trusting in God, which is our trust is to be based on His Word. We don't just say, I trust God. We have no Bible for it, for faith comes by hearing the Word of God. I trust God for something. The Bible says I have a right to. Romans 10, 17. Well, one of the things is that we're wanting it all done on our timetable. How would we ever learn to trust God and overcome worry if we didn't have those things come upon us that we had to learn to deal with? How would you ever learn the importance of benevolence if some people weren't in a bad shape so we could be benevolent? How would you ever learn to control your anger if it wasn't possible to be angry? So God's made a world perfect for what he intended it to be. Couldn't get any better. It's a place to get ready for heaven, and that means overcoming the flesh. By serving God according to his word, and that involves faith or trust or belief. That's what, if you'll read Paul, you'll see that he had learned. I have learned. Whatsoever state I'm in. Not to be satisfied, but to be content. No faithful child of God's going to be satisfied Till they walk in the streets of glory, having he heard from the lips of our Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I can be content. Great amount of fear that haunts folks is, is just simply invented, made up. Also, I think probably that one of the things that bothers us a lot is other people. We know what they ought to do, and we're doing it, but we can't get them to understand what they're doing to themselves and the ungodly lives they're living, and we fret about that. What we have to do is realize God has it all in hand. He's given me my responsibility. And my responsibility and my freedom also, or at least my freedom, I'll underscore that, pretty well ends where your nose begins, whether it's bigger or little nose. <laughs> and we don't want to allow other po folks to exercise what God says they must exercise. And that is their will. They'll give an account for whether they exercise it to know and do God's will or whether they exercise it to do as they please. I cannot force people against their will to serve God. And those people I cannot force against their will to serve God, why should I fret about it? Go back and look at how Jesus dealt with folks. And when he had given them what they needed to hear, and he knew their hearts, so he gave them exactly what they needed to hear for their soul salvation. When he gave them that, and they pulled the curtain down and said no, he went right over by his business. That's right. Turned right to his disciples and said, Shall you go away also? And Peter replied saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life and we are sure American Standard says we know that thou art the Christ the Son of the living God this 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 thing I, we've got to realize to not worry we have to be faced with the things that cause us to fret and worry and then do what the Lord said to overcome it and that's where it works fear laziness <laughs> whatever it is how do we overcome it unless we're not in a situation that allows for it. And if we're not made as we are, where we can do it. And then he gave us a will and an intellect where we can know to choose the better way. Martha, Martha, Mary hath, watch it, exercise her will, chosen the better part. Well, you don't have Jesus in the flesh in your house every day. 
And when he's there, you don't have him very long. And he's in the living room teaching, and you're wanting her to come help you do what is temporary. He wasn't saying it wasn't important, was he? He's saying there's some things far more important, and you've got to take advantage of them while they're there. And that's what the Lord meant when he said, the poor you have with you always. But I'm here just for a little while. <laughs> so we have our lives. God made us so that we can function. And the devil gives the test through this world. And we've got to choose the better part. So many times we take thought about that which we can do nothing about. Lay awake at night. You ever done that? And have you ever been sleeping and gone to bed and something crosses your mind? And just like taking a dose of caffeine, pop guys right over. I, I, when that happens to me, I just get up and go do something else. Because I'm not going to lay there. You know what happens when you lay there? It gets bigger and bigger. You're just wasting time. I get up and go write something. And if it's about the brethren, I'll just go tear them up in that, whatever it is. I feel a lot better. Of <laughs> I heard Brother Foy Smith say one time, he said, boy, he said, uh, when I get in those moods, I go and I have typed up more stuff. And next morning, it's all right because he got it out of his system. He's tore it up to what was That was for him. I wasn't for the bread. <laughs> There's ways you handle things. There's just ways you handle things. Well, so much for that. Great lesson. We all need it. And I appreciate these lessons this morning. I'll take away from yesterday or any, anything else. They're just real delivered. And I'm glad to have had a part, at least in a couple of these fellows' training. I won't claim by any means all of it. But I'm glad to have had a part in, in seeing where these fellows are and thinking if they'll stay faithful, what they can do for the Lord's church and, and, and the salvation of souls of people. When I'm no longer here or not able to, not able to function, that is an encouraging word. And uh, if I die before you do, Wayne, uh, I'm going to tell them you're coming. <laughs>